Hey guys, you may or may not have seen the update on Mr WB and the fact that he was very scarily rushed into hospital the other week. One of the events that was affected by him being in hospital was my attending the Peterborough Motorhome show. I was supposed to go up there and give a talk, several talks, uh, one of which was about taking your motorhome to Europe and some tips and tricks to make that all easier for you. What I actually did to help them out, because obviously I was not attending, was record a copy of the speech that I was going to be giving that weekend so that they had something to share with people. So hi, massive shout out to all those of you who came to the show and came to watch it and I hope you found it really useful. But I thought that those of you who weren't at the show might find it helpful as well. So here it is, here's the show that I recorded for Peterborough. Thank you to all of you who have asked over Mr WB and asked how he's doing. He's doing okay. It's going to be a long recovery, but he is slowly, very slowly, too slowly for him, moving in the right direction. So thank you all for your love and your comments and your best wishes. They are very, very much appreciated. If you'd like to get the checklist that I talk about in the video, then I'll drop the link for that below. And if you are new to our channel and you want more tips and tricks for motorhoming and camper vanning around the UK and Europe, then by all means hit subscribe. Right, without further ado, here is the talk that I was giving at Peterborough. Hey guys, I'm really sorry not to be able to be with you today. Sadly, my husband is still in hospital, although I'm hoping by the time you watch this, he will be out and on the road to recovery. But I still wanted to share our tips for touring in Europe with you. So let's get on with that. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, hi, my name is Kat. I run the website Wandering Bird, where we share tips for motorhomers and campervanners to tour the UK and Europe. About four years ago in 2018, I quit my job as an air traffic controller so that we could go and explore Europe in our motorhome. That was with my husband and my daughter initially. She then grew up, decided she was too cool for us, so we swapped her for a Cocker Spaniel. Um, both had their pros and cons, and we'll get to touring in Europe with kids and pets very shortly. But that's what we've been doing, give or take 2020. We don't talk about 2020. Uh, but that's what we've been doing as much as we possibly can, and we have made loads of mistakes, and I'm gonna share some of those with you today in the hopes that you can avoid the same mistakes that we have made. Before I get started, if you want a copy of free downloadable and printable checklists that tell you everything that you need to take with you, then head to wandering-bird.com forward slash show and you can get that there. Right, let's dive in. So a question I get asked all the time is, is the ferry or the tunnel better? <laughs> and unfortunately the answer is, it depends. And it depends on a number of things. The first is cost. Generally speaking, and of course this is going to depend on the size of your vehicle, but generally speaking, the tunnel is cheaper than a ferry at the moment. Um, so that is certainly a cost saving point of view, especially if you book through uh, either one of the motorhome clubs or a, another club where they buy the crossings in bulk, they then pass on the savings to you as a member. Also, you can use things like your Tesco club car points to make the uh, tunnel crossing a little bit cheaper. However, if, like us, you travel a lot from the either from Portsmouth or the west of the UK or even from the north of the UK, going all the way down to Dover to then go to Calais, and we travel an awful lot to the west coast of France, going all the way down there to then cut back across to the west coast of France, it's a really, really long drive. And the, the downside to the tunnels is that you don't really get a break in the driving. So we actually prefer to take the ferry. We use the Portsmouth Con Ferry an awful lot and we use that crossing specifically because they have dog friendly pet cabins on board. So you can actually bring your pet into the cabin with you overnight. We tend to do an overnight crossing so we can get some sleep, wake up the next morning and then do the driving. And for us that works really well. However, for maybe 80% of our trips where we're going further east in Europe, if we're going somewhere like Switzerland or Austria or uh, even Germany, we would take the tunnel because it's a much more direct route, it's faster, uh, it's a little bit cheaper and there are a lot more crossings. Um, even if you don't have a flexible ticket, it's a lot less restrictive than a ferry where it only goes say twice or three times a day. Um, with the, cross the tunnel there's way more more crossings that you can then choose from. So it does depend on where you're going and where you're coming from in the UK and also whether or not you're traveling with pets. The other thing to bear in mind is whether or not you're carrying anything which can't go on the tunnel, then of course you'll be restricted to the ferry. 
So the next important thing that you need to know is what's the stuff that you have to carry with you when you take your vehicle to Europe. And this applies whether you're taking a motorhome, a camper van, or even a car with a caravan. The majority of these are gonna be exactly the same. So the first thing you have to take is a high-vis jacket, and that's per person, not just whoever's gonna get out the vehicle. So everybody in the motorhome or the car has to have a high-vis jacket that fits them. It doesn't apply to baby babies, but toddlers do need one because obviously they could get out the vehicle and run into the road or something like that. So everybody needs one. They have to be accessible from within the vehicle. So don't store them in the garage of your motorhome or don't store them in the caravan if you're in a car because you need to be able to get them before you get out onto the road. If you're spotted on the side of a road without a high-vis jacket, specifically in France, uh, they will probably fine you. Next thing to remember is your headlight converters, those little stickers that go on the headlight because you're driving on the opposite side of the road to the UK. Um, a lot of people ask me when they should fit these. I recommend that you do not fit them or try and fit them on either the tunnel or the ferry because you're so close together that you will inadvertently put them in the wrong place and it will cause all kinds of chaos. So I recommend that you fit them either whilst you're waiting to board or on the other side, unless you're gonna be turning up right in the middle of the night and need them immediately, it's fine to fit them on the other side. If you're turning up in daytime, they don't need to be fitted immediately. Of course, you've got to carry spare bulbs for all of your driving lights, and I recommend you carry them for all of your interior lights as well. Warning triangle. Now, everybody needs a warning triangle. There is all sorts of rumors going around that you need two, especially if you're going to Spain. You don't need to if you're going to Spain unless you are a resident in Spain. I don't understand why, don't ask. Um, but if you are a visitor, one is more than sufficient. First aid kit. Now, in some countries, this is an essential mandatory requirement. You must have a first aid kit. In other countries, it's a you should really have a first aid kit. They don't specify what you have to carry in it. And I recommend that if you get, you know, the really mini ones that you can get in somewhere like Boots or Superdrug, if you get the next size up that's got a little bit more kit in it, that should cover you for all eventualities. Obviously, if you've got any allergies or diabetes, or anything specifically medically that you need to carry, then you'll need to carry that as well. You will need a UK sticker. So the GB sticker is now obsolete. We are no longer GB as a designator, we are UK. So you have to A, remove any GB sticker which might be on your vehicle, but also then put on a UK sticker. Now, if you are traveling to Spain, and I believe Austria, you have to have the white sticker with the black lettering not just one on your reg plate. I don't know why, um, it's a bit frustrating. So you don't necessarily need one on your registration plate, we've chosen to put them on there, but if we do travel into Spain, we would also need to put the big white one on the back as well. If you're traveling in the winter for pretty much every country in Europe, it will be required that you have either snow chains or winter tires fitted. I'll be honest, if you are planning on traveling in winter, I highly, highly recommend that you get either winter tires or certainly all purpose tires fitted um, because it makes driving so much safer, especially on a larger vehicle like a motorhome. But there are some areas um, and there are some requirements where you must have things like snow chains, especially if you're going to mountainous areas in the winter. You may also need clean air tacks or vignettes. Now they are not the same thing. A vignette is an opposite to a toll. Um, so if you, you're in a country like say Switzerland where they don't have tolls, you will have to pay for a vignette instead. Every country in Europe, pretty much with the exception of the UK, has either a toll system or a vignette system. The clean air tax is something totally different and that's if you are going to be traveling into a built up area that is designated the clean air zone you will have to do is called a crit air sticker they have them for all over europe um, and you can find out which ones you need or which ones you're going to be going into the zone of and get them in advance if you're in a motorhome i strongly recommend that you park up outside these zones and use public transport to get into them because most of them are big cities and i wouldn't want to drive a motorhome into the middle of a big city but that is entirely up to you we've never used them because we have avoided them as much as we possibly can um, but if you are going to be going somewhere specific and you know that you need them get them in advance and they can get them shipped to your house before you leave 
Couple of other things that you might need if you are over three and a half tons and you're going to be going into a built up area in France, you might need an angle mall sticker or three of them technically fitted to your vehicle. Now there's been all sorts of controversy over this because when the law initially came out, it was only for buses and coaches and lorries and motorhomes were a bit of a gray area. They have now tightened that up. Motorhomes do have to comply with this rule. However, there are many, many, many French motorhomes which don't currently comply with this rule and what's really frustrating is you can't necessarily look at a motorhome and know whether or not it's over three and a half tons or not. For people like us who tow a trailer it's pretty obvious that we're going to be over three and a half tons. If you don't and you are under three and a half tons don't even worry about it and if you're over it it's probably worth fitting them because it's France and they do like to check these things. There are also some paperwork that you need to travel with. First off so your passport. Now thing to check on your passport is the rules have changed slightly since Brexit. Whatever your starting date was, you have exactly 10 years from that date for expiry. So ignore your expiration date, unless you've got a brand new shiny blue one, in which case your expiration date is spot on. If you've still got a red passport, the expiration date is now 10 years from your start date, regardless of what it says in your passport. And of course, you should keep that six month buffer. So you're gonna to need to check really carefully um, that your passport doesn't expire way before you think it does, because they are quite strict about this, apparently. The next thing is to make sure you've got your travel insurance. Now, if you have got one of the old EH1C cards, they are still valid. Uh, you can't get new ones, but what you can do is they have uh, global health cards, which are now available, but the level that they insure you for is way, way, way less. So I strongly, strongly recommend that you get repatriation uh, travel insurance, proper travel insurance, and also make sure you have insurance that will cover the return of the vehicle as well. If say you, you break your leg and you can't physically drive it back, how are you gonna get that vehicle back to the UK if that's where you're based? Next thing is your driving license, of course. Now, most UK driving licenses are absolutely fine if you've got that pink card bit. If you've got the green paper bit, you might need to get an IDP, but for most UK drivers nowadays, if you've got your little pink card, you won't need an IDP as well. That's a big change from what they initially thought with Brexit. Vehicle insurance, make sure that you are, of course, insured to take that vehicle into Europe. If you are hiring a vehicle or borrowing someone's vehicle, you need a signed letter from them saying that you are allowing that vehicle to cross borders, not just have to stay in the UK. Now, green cards are another thing. There was a huge, great big thing during Brexit that everybody needed to have a green card and we all dutifully got them from our insurers. That's now changed. The majority of us no longer need a green card to be visiting most of the countries in the EU. There are some notable exceptions, but off the top of my head, it's most of the Eastern countries that aren't in the EU, but the list is actually on the Wandering Bird website. Um, but there are a few countries where you will still need a green card, even if you're not towing. If you are towing a trailer, most trailers need a green card, and this is something you need to check with your insurer, but most trailers, we need a green card for our trailer. We tow two motorbikes with us and we need a green card for that. Even in the countries where the motorhome doesn't. So for most countries in the EU, we even need to carry a green card for our trailer. Your vehicle still obviously has to have an MOT. You don't have to have proof of the MOT with you, but you do need to know the date in case you have any form of accident. They will ask you when the MOT is due. You do, however, have to carry your actual V5 logbook, the real one. I strongly recommend you take a colour photocopy of it before you go, but you still need to carry the real one. And similarly, if you're carrying like we do, we tow two motorbikes, uh, we have to take the actual logbooks for those as well. Um, briefly touched on breakdown cover before, make sure that it covers you for the size of your vehicle. Many of the cheaper breakdown policies don't actually cover vehicles over three and a half tons and they're not always particularly clear. So even though you are covered for a motorhome, most of the terms and conditions are up to three and a half tons. So make sure you check that really carefully. There are only a couple of companies that I know of that will ensure, that have the, the facilities to be able to rescue a vehicle over three and a half tons and that's where the problem comes in. There are a few places where you can stay whilst you're touring in Europe. First one is obvious, it's campsites. Um, there are lots of different types of campsites all across Europe, just like there are in the UK. You can get some amazing ones with water parks or by the beach and all these facilities and they're fantastic. If you do want to stay in something like that, certainly if it's got a kids club or surf club or big facilities or it's near a beach and you want to go in the main summer months, I would strongly recommend booking that up as quickly as you can because they do get full up quickly. If you're happier to stay more inland or more remote places 
or places which have got far fewer facilities and you can generally find them as you go. If you're touring outside of the main peak season, we love a system called ACSI. Don't ask me what it stands for, they keep changing it. But it is basically uh, it's an app or an a card, it's a membership, where you can get discounted prices um, on campsites. Now, it works really well for us because we are a motorhome with two adults. Feedback that I've had from other people is that if you're only a solo adult, actually the ACSI price can be more expensive than if you were just turning up on their own, because most campsites will charge you per person. Um, so if you are traveling on your own, it might not be as effective for you, but if you are a couple or a family and you're able to travel outside the school holidays, definitely look into ACSI. They have an app, which is fantastic, um, and it can show you all the campsites, and there are hundreds and probably even thousands across Europe of campsites which apply to that. You don't necessarily need to put miles in advance, um, and it doesn't work in the peak summer season, so when they're at their busiest, you don't get any discount at all, although you can, of course, book into the campsite. You just won't get a discount. Airs. Now, airs confuse an awful lot of us in the UK, although our little network of airs in the UK is growing. Airs are approved overnight parking places for motorhomes and campervans. If you've got a caravan, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to use them. Not entirely sure why, but it's just for motorhomes and campervans. And these are places, they're literally like a car park for a motorhome or a campervan, and you can stay overnight. Some of them will even let you stay 48 or even 72 hours, although that's less rare. Normally it's 24 hours. And it's somewhere that you can just park up without fear of being moved on. They cost anywhere from being free for the night to somewhere around 15 euros. Um, many of them have got additional facilities that you pay for for an extra euro or two. So you could empty your waste, in fact, grey waste you can generally always empty for free. There's normally some sort of drainage point that you can drive over, but oftentimes they will have a black waste disposal point. So you use a couple of euro coins. Top tip, save your one euro and two euro coins. You'll need those all over the place whilst you're touring around Europe. Um, so you can put an extra couple of euros into whatever the facility is and you can empty your black waste. And you can generally also get fresh drinking water from there as well. So those are fantastic. We use airs all the time. The nice thing about airs is you cannot book them in advance. There's a small caveat to that. Occasionally, especially if you're traveling in winter in the mountains, you can book them in advance, but most of them, most of the time, you can't. So you've got just as much time as anybody else all over Europe to get into the air of your choice. Now, some airs, there is literally a waiting. On our very first trip to Europe ever, we went to the Italian lakes in the middle of August and thought we would use airs because we'd heard about them and they sounded amazing. Um, I'll be honest, it was a bad plan because they were full and they were really busy all the time. Now, what we learned was that people kind of left about 11-ish and they were parked up by two so that they could have their siesta in the heat of the day. So what we aimed to do is we actually changed the way that we traveled. It restricted us a little bit, um, but if we, what we did was we aimed to get to a place for about lunchtime, for about 12, and then we generally got a bit of a space. But if you are traveling in peak peak season, you might want to go somewhere that isn't quite as crowded or isn't quite as popular. And that way you'll find the air system works much more effectively. Of course, you can also do wild camping, stay off grid. Beware, of course, that most places around Europe it is forbidden along the seafront, certainly in France. It's forbidden in all the national parks. Um, so you do need to make sure that you're not breaking any rules. And we find these places using a Park for Night app. It's the same way that we find the airs, actually. There is a website and an app called Park for Night, and we use that all over Europe. Um, there's also another one called Camper Contact. I believe both of those now have a small charge. It's a few pounds for the year. And if you are going to be touring Europe, it's worth every penny because you can get so much detail from those. Um, but Camper Contact we like because we have a trailer. You can actually narrow down the airs, um, parking spaces by the length. And because we're generally about nine, 10 meters when we've got the trailer on the back of our 6.7 meter motorhome, it allows us to find spots that we can fit into. Another thing to bear in mind is there are um, overnight schemes all over Europe, such as in France, they've got one called France Passion, and that is a network of vineyards and other companies. I believe there's a snail farm, there's some chocolate farms, um, 
places where people want you to come, they want you to visit. Um, vineyards are brilliant. If you want to go do vineyard tours, find some in the France Passion Scheme because you can rock up. You can generally stay in their car park for free as long as you then book onto a tour or do a wine tasting or something. And then you don't have to worry about driving afterwards. So it really, really works with that. It allows you to experience a little bit of the culture and then uh, not pay for your parking as well. Now just bear in mind that a lot of them don't have facilities so you literally are just parking in their car park. So don't expect things like electric hookup or water, although some of them do have a tap that they'll let you use. But that's definitely worth doing if, if you're into that sort of thing. Next thing that I will run through very quickly is getting gas. Now getting gas is quite straightforward in Europe, actually way, way more straightforward than it is in the UK at the moment. However, if you have UK gas bottles on your motorhome, they will not work for European gas bottles. The connections are different and we made this massive mistake when we first started touring, it didn't even occur to us. But if you have a UK gas bottle, so you have the exchangeable bottles set up on your van, you're going to need to carry with you extra pigtails, you can get them off Amazon or go to your local motorhome dealer or shop and they'll be able to help you sort them out and that way you change the pigtail to adapt to the gas bottle of the country that you're in so the ones in France aren't the same as the ones in Germany I believe there are three different pigtails that you'll need for most of the countries in Europe to make life a little bit easier for yourself you can fit a refillable system and if you're going to be doing a lot of touring I highly recommend a refillable system we have got gas load there are several others uh, gas it and safe flow are two of the ones that come to mind they're all very strongly um, regulated so they're all quite safe and just make sure that you get them properly fitted and if you do fit them yourself make sure that you get someone to check it and then you need to tell your insurer as well but we find getting the refillable bottles way way easier and there is a website called mylpg.eu which you can use to then find refillable stations all around Europe Water. Water is quite straightforward, especially if you're using campsites. Most campsites have got water on them. But the nice thing about Europe is a lot of the service points, they actually have, uh, like in the main service stations on the motorways, they actually have service points for motorhomes. So you can fill in, pay a couple of euros, again, remember those coins, and they will allow you to empty your waste, grey and black, and fill up with fresh water as you're driving down the motorway. It makes life a lot easier. If you are going somewhere mountainous or doing a lot of sort of U-turns, don't fill up your water tank all the way um, because that's an awful lot of weight to be sloshing around in your van. A lot of people worry in Europe about driving on the other side of the road. I'll be honest, it's not anywhere near as terrifying as you think it's going to be because the whole road system is set up to support you driving on that side. So within 10, 15 minutes, you'll be absolutely fine. Tolls. Tolls aren't as much of a worry as you think they're going to be. If you're over 3.01 metres, you might be charged as a class four vehicle, which can get quite expensive. So if you're looking to buy a van, I highly recommend you get one under 3.01 3 metres if you're going to be touring Europe a lot. It does make the toll cost a lot cheaper. Uh, you can pay as you go. Um, most of them will take credit cards. Most of the UK cars will work most of the time. We had a couple where they didn't, so it's worth carrying a little bit of notes and cash on you as well. But one thing we have got, which is fantastic, is we have a little toll pass from a company called eMovis. I believe there are a couple of companies now that do it. And that's fantastic, because that just beeps, you go through the toll, you can avoid the queues, especially if you're traveling in peak season. And that makes life a little bit easier. I've touched on using your UK bank cards, most of them are fine, just check with your bank that A, you are able to use it in Europe, but you might also be charged a fee every time you do. 112 is your emergency number, that will work pretty much everywhere, they say that every centre has an English speaker, um, we've never had to use it, we do know a couple of people who used it and had trouble getting their point across, um, but 112 is the number to remember and that's in pretty much every country in Europe. If you're traveling with pets, oh, this is a whole other thing, um, your UK pet passport is now null and void. You will need to get an animal health certificate. The animal health certificate can be issued by only specific vets, so you need to see if your vet is one that can do it and book it up really far in advance. You have to get the animal health certificate done between uh, 10 days before you actually travel, but I would book up the appointment as far in advance as you can. Um, they still need to have all their usual jabs and the rabies jab and that has to be done at least 21 days before you travel uh, or before the animal health certificate is issued. 
um, the animal health certificate is then issued for so it's valid for four months which actually means technically your your pet can stay in Europe longer than you can you can only stay for 90 days and they'd be rolling 180 but your pet can stay for four months but as soon as you come back into the UK that health certificate is now null and void so you can't go back and forth as many times as you like in that four months you've got to pay for a new one every time which is really frustrating I know uh, to get to Europe they don't need anything specific special other than getting this animal health certificate done but to come back into the UK they must have a tapeworm tablet that has to be administered by a proper vet the animal health certificate then has to be stamped by that vet and that has to be done between one and five days before you travel so you can't do it on the day that you travel back to the UK it has to be at least 24 hours before you travel and up to five days beforehand don't forget if you're going somewhere like Norway um, they require tapeworm as well so if you're coming from the UK and going into Norway you're then going to get uh, need to get another tapeworm treatment done before you enter the Norwegian border right I think that's everything I know I've thrown an awful lot of information at you before in a very short space of time don't forget you can grab a free checklist and if you want to know everything that I've spoken about in a little bit more detail you can grab a copy of our complete guide to motorhoming in Europe it's got all sorts of things in this book it's um yeah quite useful many people have told me and it's a nice side just pop in the uh, the pocket of your motorhome as well I hope, I hope you found that useful once again I'm so sorry I couldn't attend the show in person but if you would like to get more tips and tricks for motorhoming and camper vanning around the UK and Europe by all means hit subscribe thank you as always for your time and I'll see you on the next video